Good evening. And thank you very much for coming. My name is Drew Dameron, and I'm the library manager here at the Tokyo American Club. For tonight's Tech Talk, we're very happy to be hosting Ms. Elizabeth Tesker. Tesker is an astrophysicist and science communicator at the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, also known as JAXA, in Tokyo. Originally from the UK, Elizabeth studied theoretical physics at Durham University before completing her doctorate in astrophysics at Oxford. Her science writing has appeared in publications such as Scientific American, Astronomy Magazine, Nautilus, Space.com, and The Conversation. Published in 2017, her first book, The Planet Factory, explores the formation of some of the craziest worlds we've discovered in our solar system and beyond. We'll begin tonight's event with Elizabeth's presentation, and then we'll open it up for questions from those attending in person and virtually. For those online, please use the Q&A function to submit your questions to me, and I'll pass them on to the speaker. After the Q&A, we'll have a book sale over here and a signing over here to close out the event. Those attending virtually can also purchase a book to be signed. Please just use the Q&A function again. Let me know your tech number and how you would like her to sign the book. And they are 1,560 yen. You can pick them up at the library later on when it's convenient. Thank you very much. And please join me in welcoming Elizabeth to our club. Thank you very much. Uh, slides. So today I want to talk about planets that are beyond Earth and indeed beyond our solar system. But I'm going to start with a system of planets that I hope we're all familiar with. There we go. <laughs> so this is our own solar system. The giant unlabeled yellow blob in the center-ish is the sun. And then closest to the sun, we have our four rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And then beyond Mars, we have the giants. These are planets where the majority of their volume is filled by their colossal atmospheres. So this is Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Now I'm gonna get back on. So until the early 1990s, these were all the planets that we knew. It wasn't that we didn't think there wouldn't be other planets out there around other stars, but we had no firm evidence of this until the early 1990s, where we started to be able to see their very, very small signatures. However, in 1988, a wobble was spotted around a star called Gamma Zephy. And it seemed to be moving back and forth as if something unseen with gravity was pulling on it. There. <laughs> so could this be the signature of the first exoplanet, an unseen gravitational body, causing this star to make a small wobble as it moved around and pulled on the star itself. Well, sorry, I'm having some troubles with this clicker. Well, there were some reservations about this discovery. The first big reservation the discoverers had was that Gamma Zephy was not alone in the sky. Gamma Zephy, was part of a binary star system, meaning that it had a stellar sibling. Now, binary stars are actually quite common in the galaxy. Thank you, like that. <laughs> so binary star systems are actually very common in the galaxy, where you tend to get these pairs of stars that orbit one another. However, what was very notable is our star, our own sun, is not part of a binary. It has no stellar sibling it's orbiting. And this was the only star we knew of with a planetary system. So sure, there was this hint of a wobble, but could planets even form in a binary star system? Mm, people were skeptical. The second problem was that Gamma Zephy was thought to be a giant star. 
And these are stars that are reaching the end of their life. And as they get old, well, they get a little bit cantankerous. And in particular, their outer atmosphere starts to show a lot of vibrations, pulsations that might look just like a wobble due to a planet. So based on these two facts, when this paper was published, the astronomers acknowledged that yes, there was this wobble, but thought on reflection, it was unlikely to be due to a planet. And when they published that and they made that statement, they missed discovering the first exoplanet because this wobble actually was due to a planet, but it wasn't confirmed until 2013. So why was this missed? I mean, why were people very conservative? Now, of course, it is sensible if you have a really big announcement like the first planet found outside our solar system, you do want to be careful. You want to check your data. But nevertheless, this would have been amazing to be on the team that discovered the first exoplanets. So were they, were they too conservative? Should they have thought that it was possible that a planet could be there? Well, to understand why they were cautious, we have to take a look first at binary star systems and how planets are formed. So, this shows observations taken by the ALMA telescope of disks that circle young stars. So almost all young stars are circled by these disks of dust and gas. And this is where we're going to build our planets. So within these disks, you start off with microscopic sized grains of dust. And these collide and stick and slowly reach millimeter, centimeter, meter sized, and go up to kilometer size and eventually gravity finally gets enthusiastic about the whole process and pulls these rocks into a sphere and you have something that starts to resemble an actual planet. Now let's think about what happens if you have two stars in the system. So here is our top down view. We have our star in the center and we have our disk of dust and gas around the outside. And then the solid gray circles are the rocks that we're building up to form our planets. At this stage, they're really like planetesimals, meters to kilometers in size. And they're moving around on roughly circular orbits around their star. Now let's add a second star. What happens? Well, two things happen and neither of them are good. The first thing is that over all the disk and the planetesimals, these rocky building parts, are going to feel the gravity of their own star. That's fine. It's the closest star to them. It's going to be the strongest force in the block. But that second star's gravity cannot be entirely ignored. It's going to have a second pulling force towards it, albeit weaker. So that results in the disk starting to be pulled towards the star. Now, the disk wants to rotate around its own star faster than the second star is moving. So what you end up with is a drag force. The disk wants to rotate away as it goes in its orbit, but that second star is pulling it back. So the gas starts to slow. And as it slows, the disk starts to contract. And it shrinks. So there you were with a nice large disk, plenty of space to form your planets, going to last a long time. And suddenly that disk is a lot smaller in size and it's falling in towards the star. So the time you have to form the planets and the space you have to do it in has just shrunk. The second problem concerns your rocks that you're trying to get to collide and stick to build your planets. Now, in those case, they were moving around, feeling the gravity of the star in nice circular orbits. But now, thanks to this second star appearing, they're going to be dragged onto elongated elliptical orbits. And these, it turns out, are really bad for building planets. And the problem is collision speed. If you're on a circular orbit, you're moving at the same speed as everything else on the circular orbit with you. So it's like going along parallel lanes on the highway. OK, they should be at different speeds, but they're often not. So bear with me. Let's pretend they're all at the same speed. If you look at the car next to you, it's moving at roughly the same speed as you. So it looks almost stationary. 
if you were to collide with that car, don't try this at home, if you were to collide with that car, your collision would be relatively gentle because you're both moving at the same speed. Now, you've been on bent elliptical orbits. It's no longer a highway. Instead, it's dodgem bumper cars at the fair. And you're all moving in different directions and at different speeds. So in these cases, you now collide with much higher speeds because you're moving at different speeds. So when you come together, that collision is fast and it rebounds. Just like the bumper cars at the fair, if you charge another car, the chances are you rebound and go away. But what you want is to stick if you're trying to form a planet. So you want things on nice ordered circular orbits where collisions are slow and things can stick together. You don't want them on elliptical bumper car orbits where the collisions are fast and rebound is much more likely than building up that planet. So basically, stellar siblings are really bad for your health. And this was proved observationally with the Kepler Space Telescope. So this was a NASA built telescope launched in 2009 and it was the first telescope to be dedicated to finding planets outside our solar system. And what Kepler did is it looked at a whole load of binary stars and says, are you forming these planet making disks or not? And it discovered that the two stars really have to be greater than 1500 times the distance between the sun and the earth, what we call 1500 AU apart. If that's true, you're fine. You can both form planets. You can pretty much forget about the stellar sibling. But if you're closer than that, your planet formation is going to be affected. That said, making it more difficult doesn't mean that it's impossible. So if you are, if the two stars are between a thousand to several hundred times the distance of the Earth and the Sun, then it is possible, at least, for you both to have these planet forming disks. So in that case, it might be slightly more difficult, but you can form what are effectively cousin systems of planets. Both stars can have their own planetary systems. Now let's move those stars a bit closer together. If we move them so they're sort of tens apart, so really it's the equivalent of two stars in the same solar system, but the other star is at the edge of the solar system. Then in that case, it's really hard for both those stars to form planets. It seems that typically only one star will form that protoplanetary disk. And the second star, it just won't last long enough to really get the planet formation process going. Move the stars closer again. So now they are roughly the distance between the sun and the earth. And you can still form a disk. But that disk no longer goes around just one star. Instead, it loops around both. So if you form a planet in there, you circle two suns. And actually, we all know a system that does this. Because it is the idea behind the Star Wars fictional world of Tatooine, where Luke Skywalker does the I, possibly members of the audience who are too young for this, but I'm hoping most people realize <laughs> that there's a classic scene where Luke is looking over the two suns that his planet is orbiting. So is it actually possible not only to have a planet in this situation, but for it to be habitable? Now Tatooine, borderline, but apparently habitable. But could this really be true? So obviously to discuss habitability is a really, really complex topic and there's a huge amount that goes into it. But from the point of view of binary star systems, the only thing we really care about is sunlight. So does having that second star with that second source of sunlight, starlight, make a difference so you can't have habitable conditions? It's a little slow. Okay, so yes, yeah, sunlight, go on. Yeah, there we go. So now if you have roughly the same amount of sunlight as the Earth, then we say you're in the so-called habitable zone, which is the region in which the Earth can support liquid water on its surface. Now this habitable zone comes with a lot of small print, and indeed I have an entire hour talk talking about the habitable zone, <laughs> which you'll be relieved to hear I'm not going to give now. 
But I will summarize and say that the habitable zone is for the Earth. That is a planet with our surface pressure and our atmosphere of nitrogen, oxygen and carbon dioxide. If you have a different planet in the habitable zone, it probably can't support liquid water. And we can demonstrate that quite easily. So here's the Earth, the blue dot, and the yellow dot is Venus. And you might say, great, <laughs> Venus certainly can't support liquid water. Its surface temperature is enough to melt lead. And indeed, it is not inside the habitable zone. However, both the Moon and Mars are inside the habitable zone, and neither of them have surface liquid water. But what we know, based on models, is that if you put the Earth in Mars's orbit, it should just about be able to support liquid water on its surface. Mars can't do it because it's only half the size of the Earth and its atmosphere is only 1% as thick. So it can't protect itself against the colder climate and therefore anything on Mars freezes. Though helicopters do fly. Did we see that news the other day? <laughs> But yes, on that fact, a helicopter, Ingenuity, had to spin its blades, I think, 2,500 RPMs in order to get flight. A regular Earth helicopter is about 400 to 500 RPMs, which shows you how thin Mars's atmosphere is. So, habitable zone, very appropriate as long as you're the Earth. Not so appropriate if you're not the Earth. But... What happens to that habitable zone, assuming that we have another Earth out there, if we have these two suns? Well, if we have just one sun, then the habitable zone is symmetrical, going nightly around the star. This is a 2D diagram, but picture it in 3D. It doesn't matter which way you orbit. Now, if you have a stellar system with two suns that are roughly the same mass, same luminosity, then what you get is a kind of squidged habitable zone. It looks like a capsule. If your two suns are different masses, so one is bright and one is dim, then you get an almost symmetrical habitable zone, but with a kind of bump off to one side. Now, you might look at that and say, well, OK, it's a bit more tricky, but I could draw myself a nice orbit around those stars, which keeps me nicely within the habitable zone without any problem but you're forgetting one thing. Those stars aren't stationary, they're moving, and they're moving at a different rate to your planet. So what that means is that the, dis the distance to those two stars changes continuously over the planet's year. So just because it starts in the habitable zone, oops, sorry, doesn't mean it necessarily stays there. So if you're anywhere near the edge of that habitable zone, you can be knocked in and out during your year because the stars are changing position. And indeed, we know of a planet that does exactly that. That is Kepler-16b. Now, Kepler-16b was discovered in, what is that, 2001? Yeah, it, 2011. And it is not rocky. It's not remotely Earth-like. Its mass is close to that of Saturn. However, if it were rocky, or if it maybe had some rocky moons, they would be in the star's habitable zone. Now, Kepler-16 is a binary system. It has one bright star, and it has one dim one. So you get this almost symmetrical habitable zone with a bump that moves. And what you find is this is actually a simulation of the orbit of Kepler-16b. The two black circles in the center are the two stars. The green area is your habitable zone, and then the outer dark blue line is the orbit of Kepler-16b. And you'll see that over its year, it kind of dives in and out of the habitable zone. Now, if you do a model of what that does to the planet, what you find is that the global temperature of that planet changes by up to 15 degrees multiple times during its orbit. Now, 15 degrees I'm sorry, I'm in Celsius, but I'm hoping you get the idea. Um, 15 degrees doesn't sound too bad. I mean, difference between winter and summer, easily that amount. However, this is not local variations. This is a global temperature change. And to give you an idea of what that means, in the 1600s, there was a little ice age and the Thames in London froze. The Thames in London does not normally freeze or come close, but it froze completely solid. 
And it's predicted that the global temperature change over that period was just one to two degrees. And it made a huge difference to our climate. So a global temperature change of 15 degrees multiple times during the year is a really big deal. So could life even survive it? Well, obviously we don't know yet. At the moment, we still have very limited information about these planets. We tend to know size, we know orbits, but we don't yet know what's going on on their surfaces. However, models suggest it might be possible. You might be able to have a system where life effectively hibernates during the very inhospitable times and emerges to you know, procreate and get out and about uh, during the calmer periods. So in which case our Tatooine might be a case of, you know, the force will awaken in about six months. Incidentally, the same person who did this paper, Stephen Kane, also looked at the orbit of Tatooine based on the movies. And he thinks it's not actually stable. So not that that really matters in terms of the potential for planets around uh, two stars, but that particular planet might not have a very stable orbit. So another star, that has a binary twin is 55 Cancri. And I love this system. And you'll see why shortly. So 55 Cancri has a star that's quite small and quite a long way away. And it hasn't stopped it forming a system of five planets. So the distance to its minor star is too large to disrupt that. However, that star is still playing a role on that planetary system because its gravitational tugs are actually slowly turning the system upside down. Now, if you were on a planet on that system, you'd, you'd stay on the planet because the gravity would still be holding you to the surface. So you wouldn't feel you were turning upside down. But if you were to look at the night sky, you would slowly see the constellations turn about you as your system flipped. Now, my favorite planet in this system is 55 Cancri E. And that's because people don't quite know what it's made of. And all the options are truly awful. I mean, really bad. Like you thought, whatever death you've ever pictured in your worst nightmares, I'm about to give you three worse alternatives. So this planet was a bit of a mystery because when its mass and its radius were measured, it was discovered that it was too dense to be a gas giant like Neptune or Jupiter, but it was too light to be a rocky world like the Earth. So what's it made of? Well, if you want something that's in between rock and gas, an obvious candidate would be a, a liquid. So could it be a water world? Now the Earth is relatively water poor, even though we think of it as a blue planet, it's only really on the surface. So by mass, we only have about 0.01% of our mass in water. If you want a planet where the density is in between the rock and the gas giants, you're talking like 50% water, so really watery. But you might say, well, wait a minute, this, this can't be right because 55 Cancri E is obviously really close to its star. And in particular, one orbit or one year on this planet takes a staggering 18 hours. And the star is very similar to our sun in luminosity. So you're looking at average temperatures of, yes, around 2000 Celsius. It doesn't even matter what that is in Fahrenheit. It's really hot. So therefore, could you honestly have a water world? Well, it turns out that the planet is larger and more massive than the Earth. So to accompany these high temperatures, you also end up with very high pressures. And that does allow you to sort of have water, but not as a liquid. Instead of very high temperatures and very high pressures, water becomes what we call supercritical, which is this state in between a liquid and a gas. So if you were on this planet and you were able to survive the rather toasty conditions, you would find yourself maybe suspended in a fog where you couldn't quite tell where the water began and the atmosphere started. So that's one option. A second option is maybe, maybe it's just made of lighter stuff than the Earth. So the Earth's core is predominantly iron and nickel, and the mantle and crust is mainly silicate, man, uh, iron and magnesium. So could you just take the planets and put different elements in there and just make it a bit lighter? 
Well, evidence that you might be able to do this came from observations of the star itself, where observations showed that unlike our sun, this star had a lot more carbon in it. So if that's reflected in the material that built the planets, then you find you have a very carbon rich system. And this starts to replace oxygen when you form minerals. So what you find is that the surface crust would become graphite, same stuff as in pencils. And then the mantle itself, instead of being silicate, which is silicon and oxygen, would become silicon carbide and carbon. And as you move down into the planet where the pressure gets higher and higher and higher towards the core, that carbon would become very compressed and very compressed carbon gives you diamonds. Yeah, so this is a diamond world is your option too. Uh, so if there was, if this was true and there was volcanic activity on the planet, it might actually spew diamonds. But let's, you know, before we get too excited, let's remember the graphite crust, the incredibly high temperatures. Any liquid would be melted tar, and if there was an atmosphere, we're talking carbon monoxide. So don't get too thrilled about this. Now, option three came about because of some new observations. The, this planet was not discovered just due to the wobble, which we saw before for Gamma Zephy, but it was also seen to transit. Now, a transit occurs when we have a very lucky alignment and the planet passes in front of the star as seen from Earth. And you get a small drop in starlight because the planet obscures a little bit of that star's surface. And when this transit was measured for Cancri phi, uh, 55 Cancri E, it was measured in 2011 and also in 2013. And the result was different there seemed to be more of the starlight obscured in 2013. In fact, the planet seemed to increase in size by 25% in two years. That's not how planet formation works. So what was going on? Was this a mismeasurement? You know, how could the planet suddenly swell up? And to accompany that, they also found the planet seems to have become hotter if that was even possible. <laughs> so it's gone from, you know, something close to around one one and a half thousand degrees up to 2,000 or well, 2,700 degrees. So it's got bigger and it's got hotter. What could be causing this? And the authors of this paper proposed one option was that this was an incredibly volcanic world, something that makes the Earth look completely calm and even Io, the moon of Jupiter, which is incredibly volcanic, just look pff, weak. So the idea here is if the world really was incredibly volcanic, that it could be spewing this volcanic ash into the atmosphere. And as the ash thickened, it would block out more light. So it would appear that the planet had enlarged simply because its atmosphere had become opaque. And then the volcanic activity could die away and you'd see instead the surface of the planet was the only thing blocking that light and the atmosphere would be transparent again. So this was another option. Now we don't know which of those options is true. <laughs> They're all delightful, but we do know something else about the planet. And that is regardless of what it's made of, it does orbit very, very close to its star. And that has another effect on the planet itself. And that is it gets squidged. Okay, I have greatly exaggerated the amount of squidge there. But the point is, the star's gravity raises a bulge on the planet's surface, actually the same way that the Earth raises a small bulge on the moon. And the result is exactly the same. So as that planet tries to move around in its orbit, because it has this slight bulge, it's dragged back to face the star. So it ends up in tidal lock with one side always facing the star, just in the same way we only ever see one side of the moon from Earth. Now, when you have a planet going around a star that does this, you end up with one hemisphere of the planet being a land of eternal day where the sun never sets. And one half of that planet is forever night and it never ever sees the sun. And this is actually quite common in many of the planets we've discovered since you just need to be near your star and the easiest planets to find the ones that are near their star. So, for example, our nearest exoplanet 
is Proxima Centauri b, the orbits, unsurprisingly, Proxima Centauri, our nearest star. And it is also thought to be in tidal lock because its orbit is just 11.7 days, no, 11.2 days. Now, that's obviously better than 18 hours, 55 Cancri e, but it still seems rather short. For comparison, Mercury's orbit is 88 days. However, Proxima Centauri b is a very weak star. It's what we call a red dwarf. So its brightness is much, 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 much lower than the sun. And that means that if you look at the amount of starlight that Proxima Centauri b receives, it's actually pretty similar to the Earth, and this puts it in the habitable zone. So if it's not Mars and it's more like Earth and it has our atmosphere, potentially Proxima Centauri b could support water, except it is in tidal lock. So in that case, you would have one side of the planet hot and one side of the planet cold. Now, what happens then? It all depends on the planet's atmosphere. If the atmosphere is too thin, it just absolutely collapses and you get no atmosphere at all because it moves around to the night side, it freezes, falls to the surface. The atmosphere in the day side comes around to join it, freezes, falls to the surface. You have a planet with no atmosphere. However, if the atmosphere is thick enough and models suggest the Earth's atmosphere might do it, then it can actually redistribute that heat by moving around the planet. And so you don't exactly get temperate planets, planet all over probably, but you keep the atmosphere and you're able to have some rebalancing of that heat between the day side and the night side. And in that case, the most temperate place to be will probably be on the edge between your day and night side. So if you were to live on such a world, you would live on a twilight world where the sun was always on the horizon and never rose and never set. So can we visit these planets? This shows a diagram of the planets we've discovered in our galaxy. And most of them are in that tiny red blob centered around our sun, with a few exceptions where we've seen planets a bit further afield. But we've only explored a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of our own galaxy in terms of seeing these other planets. However, they're still really far away. So this is a nice movie, but not actually the planet I want to talk about. This shows you where the star HR8799 is. But the main point is our nearest exoplanet is Proxima Centauri b. And if we wanted to go there and we sent Voyager 1, which is our furthest and farthest spacecraft, if that was pointing in the right direction, which it isn't, but this is about to become very irrelevant. If it was pointing in the right direction, it would still take 75,000 years to reach Proxima Centauri b. Now, there are some other projects that people have considered. You may have heard of Project Starshot, uh, which is uh, funded privately to look at ways of sending very, very small light spacecraft across these sort of distances within a few decades. They're really interesting ideas, but they're still futuristic at the moment. So what can we do if we actually want to learn more about these planets than just you know, their size and orbit? Well, fortunately, that is going to be possible rather soon. So these two telescopes, the JWST, which optimistically might launch later this year. And below it is Ariel, which is the European Space Agency's telescope, which will launch at the end of the decade, are going to be looking at planet atmospheres through a technique called transmission spectroscopy. And the idea here is you've got a transiting planet, it's moving across the star, and it's going to block out a bit of that light. Now, as with 55 Cancri e, the atmosphere may also block out the light. If it's not full of ash and it's just a regular atmosphere, it will block out certain wavelengths. So what you'll find, here's the light coming from the star. It passes through the atmosphere at different wavelengths. And some of those molecules like oxygen, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, nitrogen will absorb particular wavelengths. So you want to look at that transit in different wavelengths and you'll see the planet changes size because if those wavelengths are being absorbed very strongly by particular molecules in the atmosphere, then the planet will appear slightly larger because the atmosphere will be opaque. And by working backwards, you can say, ah, well, I didn't see any red light there. That'd be more precise, I guess, with different wavelengths. But the general idea is, okay, we saw 
the red light was absorbed. Therefore, maybe this means we've got water molecules in the atmosphere. Uh, so by doing that, you get a hint of the sort of molecules that might be in the atmosphere of these planets. And that will give us our first hint of what might be really going on on the surface. And it might, at least one day, give us a hint of life too. So the truth is out there, guys. So fun things <laughs> that I thought I'd share as an end. Uh, one is this blog. This is a NASA supported blog called Many Worlds. Um, I'm one of the feature writers for it. I'm not the main one. The main one is Mark Kaufman. He used to be the NASA correspondent for the Washington Post. And this blog specializes in long form articles. Neither Mark nor I can ever shut up about exoplanets. They tend to be slightly on the long side, um, but they're detailed and they explain new research results and they're supposed to be jargon free, fingers crossed. Uh, so please do take a look if you're interested. I have little cards for this. You can take one away with you. Um, the other cool thing is a little website that I designed to try and explain how different exoplanets can be. So one of the problems I've had with the media that's made me really very angry is that you find a planet that's roughly the same size as the Earth and you get these media headlines, most Earth-like planet ever discovered. And I'm like, dude, you I mean it's got a radius that's only 10% larger than us, but Venus is closer than that, so that is not Earth-like. So I wanted to try and explain to people, look, even if you had a planet that was really, really like ours, so same size, same atmosphere, same geochemical processes, it might still end up being really, really different on the surface. So this is the idea behind Earth-like. You get to play with three parameters that seem really minor. You get to play with the land fraction. You can change the volcanic rate compared to Earth, and you can change the position within the habitable zone. And you can do this on the website or you can tweet at it. And all of those have changed during the Earth's history. So they seem pretty minor, shouldn't really be making much of a difference. Yeah, you try it. You'll find you can do everything from desert worlds to snowballs. So if you think of the diversity you can get with these three seemingly very minor changes, just think of the diversity that really must be out there when we can start changing things like composition in and out of the habitable zone, the amount of water on a planet and all the other things. I have cards for this one too. So this is kind of amusing. Um, a few years ago, I was approached by a, a young adult author who said, hey, Elizabeth, do you want to be in my book? I was like, definitely. <laughs> so I am actually a fictional character in a book called The Center of the Universe. And the book is aimed at teenagers. And the story is actually not astrophysics. The main story is a 17 year old called Grace, whose mother goes missing. And it's about sort of what happens when you have a missing person, like you don't know why they disappeared. Did they leave? Were they kidnapped? You've, you've got no information. And you're sitting in this sort of perpetual waiting room waiting for news. So it's about that primarily. But Grace happens to be very, very keen on exoplanets and she goes uh, to a talk by your local professional astrophysicist, which would be me. <laughs> so she attends a talk like this one and uh, meets me in the book. Uh, so that was great fun. And then finally, a shameless pitch for my own book. If you enjoyed the number of ways you can die on 55 Cancri E, I guarantee you there are even worse ones in this volume. So <laughs> here I look at how the solar system formed, how we thought we understood planet formation. It turned out we really didn't. Some really wacky worlds, including the first exoplanet ever discovered, which was around a dead star called a pulsar. And some really dastardly worlds that might be out there. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So we're going to open it up for questions. If anyone has any, please feel free to walk up to the microphone here. Uh, right off the bat, I have one virtual question here from someone who's joined us virtually. Sorry, about to die. <coughs> okay. <laughs> okay. How old were you when you knew you wanted to work on space? Ah, projects? yeah. I, so I have two answers to that question. One is nine. <laughs> this was the age I was when my dad took me to the planetarium in London and I absolutely loved the experience. However, I didn't decide then and there that I wanted to work on space. I was pretty convinced. Anyone who actually 
read the article that was in the magazine will know that I was obsessed with becoming a vet until I was in my teens and actually got some careers advice. Um, so although I was interested as a child, I didn't know, I didn't have a vocation that I wanted to do space, at least not one I recognised. And I felt as a child that a lot of the books you read have children with vocations. You know, they're amazing ballerinas, they're amazing singers, they're amazing artists, they're amazing musicians. And I actually felt quite sad during my childhood that I didn't feel I had an outstanding gift. And I would talk to my parents and I'd be like, what are my gifts? <laughs> and, you know, my parents would be like, Elizabeth, everyone is gifted. And I'm like, yeah, what am I? What am I? And they never gave me a satisfactory answer. <laughs> And of course, what they said was completely true. Everyone does have gifts, but most people, it isn't wildly obvious when you're a child what those gifts are. A few people get lucky and they get outstanding vocations, but most of us, we find our way a little later. So while I was interested in astronomy as a child, you know, I didn't know I was going to pursue this career. And I would say to anyone who's on the younger side in the audience, if you don't know what you want to do yet, neither did I. Have you been to the moon? <laughs> no, and I don't want to go either. People often ask, you want to be an astronaut? Do you know how terrifying rockets are? Like they're just all this fuel and they strap you to the top and no. <laughs> I am not down for that. I don't even like roller coasters. So very few people get to be astronauts. I'm hopeful I would never qualify. I'm pretty sure I can't do it accidentally, so it should be okay. <laughs> um, I'm sure it would be an incredible experience. And if you want to be an astronaut, I absolutely say go for it. But please, love of God, do not take me with you. Sorry, um, I heard before about the, your, the Alpha Centauri B planet. And, and I, was, I remember being very excited that we actually found a planet that seemed at the time Earth-like or, or whatever, and it was happened to be the closest star to us. And in the um, the reading that I saw, they said that actually going to that planet would would probably require um, a rocket that used antimatter as the engine. And I'm just wondering, is that even something that we think is remotely yeah a, a, a viable I, engine? I think. At the moment, <laughs> as far as I'm aware, nothing, not even a prototype, has been developed that could do something like that. So I believe, I hope I'm speaking accurately, that that is more of a science fiction idea. Like it might work in theory, but there's no... So we're never going to get there, like within any... So I think the most probable way of getting to Proxima Centauri B would be something like what Project Starshot are doing, where they're looking at sending really, really tiny spacecraft. They might just contain like a camera and that would be it. And you might be able to accelerate them to not the speed of light, but maybe I've heard 20% of the speed of light. And they've thought about different ways of doing this. I believe they've thought about using lasers for the acceleration, but we don't currently have a laser on Earth that could do that kind of acceleration. But again, it's technically possible. It sounds a bit dangerous. <laughs> uh, sounds a little bit like um, uh, what's the what's the movie I'm thinking of with uh, it's going to come to me with Doctor Evil. <laughs> Laser, that one. Yeah. <laughs> so, but thank you, Austin Powers. So that's all, all I think of every time people say uh, uh, Project Starshot. I'm like. Um, but in theory, it is possible, and they are doing active research in that area to try and so make it is, happen. There are projects that are thinking absolutely. About. There are projects that are happening. I couldn't tell you a timeline for them because I don't know how how far they've gone from theoretical into even the start of experimental. But it's not impossible. Yes, um, my totally uninformed opinion is that um, given the billions of stars and billions of galaxies out there, it's almost 
mathematically unimaginable that there wouldn't be life somewhere in the universe. Is that the correct way to think yes. about this? I think the short answer to that question is absolutely. I think a lot of people would be on your side with that. Um, the more sceptical answer is, will we ever find it? And I think we will. Uh, but I think our first contact will is unlikely to be intelligent life, because if you take the argument that life has to evolve, then and there might be bottlenecks in that process that kind of stop it, then it seems much more likely that you'll have far more planets with the start of life than you will that have reached an, maybe not the peak, but an intelligent civilization. So these uh, telescopes like JWST and Ariel, or they're sort of still a little bit prototypes, maybe the ones that come after those that can look at temperate worlds, I hope we'll find signatures that might be life. I think there's going to be a couple of problems. One is proving categorically and absolutely that that is a biological signature. Because these planets have very different conditions to the Earth, it is possible they might be produced by abiotic means, and we're going to have to do a lot of theoretical work to rule out those pathways. So, for instance, if anyone followed the discovery of phosphine in the Venus atmosphere, and people were like, it might be a biosignature, but Venus is such a different planet, it could also be produced elsewhere. That's the sort of debate that's going to be raging for these. Um, now, in terms of intelligent life, you're right, the numbers are probably in the favour, but we don't really know what it takes to develop an intelligent civilization because we've only got one data point. There's also the possibility that if they're far enough away, we may never meet them. And the, the, the abundance of extremophiles on Earth also must sort of even further support that idea. It does in the sense that, so for people who might not know, extremophiles are uh, animals on Earth that can live in absolutely crazy environments. I mean, the classic one is the water bears, right? The tardigrades that can survive a journey up to space without a spacesuit and they're all fine. Um, so therefore, when you see these planets with very different conditions from Earth, it doesn't seem impossible life could be there too. The possible negative for that, and it's only possible, is that all the extremophiles on Earth didn't evolve as extremophiles. They started off as regular life and then were slowly pushed in that direction. So if you have a very extreme planet, for instance, with a lot of ultraviolet radiation, can you evolve life at all? Or does it need to evolve somewhere else, become a bit more stable, a bit bigger, and then move into that environment? Again, the jury's out, we don't yet know. So promising, but no guarantees, I'd say. One more. Oh, we got okay. All right, thank you. We've got an interesting one from a virtual attendee. What would happen if a person made of matter shook hands with a person made of antimatter? I believe they would annihilate. I am not going to try and find out. Thank you. And one <laughs> other one. This is from Brandon, who's eight years old. Why did you choose to work at JAXA? I thought it would be cool, Brandon. <laughs> I mean, I, I always wanted to travel. When I was little, it was a big thing. Like I wanted to get a job that allowed me to travel and I did. Uh, science research definitely does that. Uh, so I did five years in the US. I did two years in Canada and then a position opened up in Japan and I applied for it at Hokkaido University in Sapporo. And I, I traveled there. I really liked Japan. And then I was very happy at Hokkaido University, but I had what was a pretty traditional faculty position. So my duties were primarily research and teaching. Now, I liked both of those. There was no problem. But I had no official role for outreach and science writing. And while the university had no problem whatsoever with me doing that, it didn't have any protected time in my schedule for doing it. It was like, you want to do that in your free time? Fine. But if we need another teacher for six more courses, you're up. So as Hokkaido started to expand the number of courses they were teaching in English, and as the only native English speaker in the department, <laughs> I started to see the way this was going <laughs> and became a bit worried that I wouldn't have any time for science writing. So I just started looking for positions and I saw one at JAXA. Now, this was not for a science writer. It was for a regular associate professor. And I emailed them and I said, I know you're really looking for someone to work on your missions, either as an engineer or someone who can deal directly with the data. That's, that's not me because I'm a theorist and I use a computer, but 
your Japanese outreach is far more extensive than your English outreach. And I'm also a science writer and I think I could help with that. Would you be interested in my application? And they said, yes, we would. It wasn't what we advertised for, but we are interested. And I went down and I interviewed and I basically sold the idea. And they actually ended up hiring two people for that position. There was um, my competitor, Aurora, <laughs> who was exactly the person they wanted because she was uh, working directly with their X-ray satellite data. But based on my application, they opened up a second position and hired me on the basis of the fact I could also do the science communication. And I joined the Hayabusa 2 team and I've been doing the English outreach for that mission. And I've also joined our new Martian moon exploration mission. And that was amazing. So I would say if there's a job you want to do, tell people because you never know. Like people are not going to offer you a job unless you tell them you want to do it. And uh, so thank you very much for this very inspiring talk uh, tonight. Uh, really enjoyed it a lot. So my question would be, I mean, you're working for JAXA and you also uh, made references uh, to NASA, the European Space Agency. Um, but at the same time, we see, you know, lots of uh, private uh, enterprise and, um, and, um, and people getting involved in space exploration. You know, some people care about dying on impact on Mars or something. But the, um, so where, you know, you are a professional astrophysicist, where do you think is going to be the major source of innovation and uh, discoveries. Is this going to be governments or, or, or business? Thank you very much. Um, I think there are probably two sides to that. The short answer is governments because businesses are normally have different goals for their mission. Uh, whereas governments are the people who can say, we're just going to go because it's cool, because we think there's some great science out there and we're going to do that. That said, the more launch opportunities you have, the more everyone can do. So the private industry brings a greater demand for launches and often on a rocket, you can piggyback, not literally. Uh, so you have the, you know, we're, for instance, Hayabusa 2 was the main launch for the rocket, but it carried with it three small little CubeSats that were doing the other science experiments that sort of rode along and got the launch off Earth. And that's often true. So developing small sats, these little CubeSats that can do science, might mean that even if a private company is in control of the launch and they're going to, I don't know what private companies do, look at you know, crude exploration somewhere, maybe asteroid mining in the future, you might be able to tag along with your little science mission as well. And so is that then government or is that private or is it kind of the two? So I think together we can do amazing science, but I think the people whose goal it will be to do the pure science will probably remain the government, is my guess. We've got one more from a virtual attendee. This is from Adam. In the book, The Three-Body Problem by Si Chin Lu, he talks about the impossibility of calculating the orbit of a planet orbiting three star systems. Is this correct? Um, I haven't read the book, but that I'm aware of, only the two-body problem has an exact solution. Anything else is approximate. And that is a big problem when you're doing trajectories through the solar system where you've got eight, or if you still care about Pluto, nine planets and the sun and basically everything else is pulling gravitationally on you. So you have to do calculations which do not have an exact solution, but they do have an approximate solution that's good enough. I have uh, two questions and one comment to the earlier gentleman about intelligent life. I think the proof that intelligent life is out there is they haven't contacted us yet. <clears throat> the questions are, um, if there's, do you think it's possible that we could ever get a visual image of an exoplanet and would it be worth it? Yes and yes. In fact, we do have visual images, it's direct imaging, but currently the only ones we can see easily, easily, <laughs> the only ones we can see full stop, are young, hot Jupiter-sized planets. So these typically are far from the star, and because they formed relatively recently, they're much, much warmer than our gas giants, and you can image those directly from the ground. But all you see is a black dot. You do, and you see a dot, but in the future, you could improve that technology in two ways. You should be able to see directly image more temperate planets. And if you can image it in different wavelengths, you get a similar effect to the transmission spectroscopy 
I mentioned, where light that's being reflected or in the case of hot Jupiter is actually emitted, but in a temperate world probably reflected from its atmosphere and surface will be missing certain wavelengths because they'll be absorbed by what's on the planet. And so by spotting those missing wavelengths, you get an idea of the composition of the planet. So you're not zooming in and seeing a Starbucks, but you are getting real information from that image. OK, great. And the second question was how much of a real problem is things like um, the Starlink program with the satellites for you, for people like yourself? You mean for in terms of um, space junk? Yes. Yeah, it's a bit of a problem. Um, I don't know how close we are to catastrophe, <laughs> um, but it's a big issue. The Starlink satellites have two problems. One is, of course, the prospect of space junk being up there clogging orbit and making it dangerous for things like the International Space Station. The other problem is the night sky. Um, it's been, despite vague promises that they will be dark enough, uh, my friends regularly show images they've taken through massive telescopes which are streaked with the Starlink satellites. Indeed, if you go to the Hyobusa 2 website and you see uh, images of the capsule returning to Earth. So Hyobusa 2 dropped off a sample capsule on December 6, 2020 of the samples it collected from Ryugu and there are two twin streaks in the sky. One is us and one is a Starlink satellite. But my friends on these you know, really powerful telescopes show nights where it's just a streak of Starlink satellites. And these are telescopes where you have to apply years in advance for a night and you're already fighting the weather. To have to fight the Starlink satellites as well to see your objects, it's a huge waste of these facilities. It's a waste of everyone's money. And what worries me slightly is I felt there wasn't really much negotiation. Like it was one private investor with a lot of money sent these up and there wasn't any control facility to say, wait a minute, we need to discuss this. You can't just do that. Um, and I think that space policy is going to become bigger and bigger as again with the rise of private companies, like who can do what where. Unfortunately, it may come a little bit too late in some areas. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, amazing talk. Uh, we can't really, I mean, we can hardly observe planets, uh, so I assume it's really hard to observe, observe planet formation. You said a few things about like rocks getting you know, colliding or not or getting together. Uh, is is planet formation in any way like satellite formation like in, in yeah. Jupiter? And can we actually observe satellite formation in the uh, orbit of, uh, of Saturn, for example, or Jupiter? Mm. So the first part is yes, there are actually three ways to form a moon. One is like how our moon was formed, giant collision. One is the prospect of capturing satellites. So that might be Mars, jury's still out there, uh, but it is certainly Triton around Neptune. But the really big gas giants probably formed in the same way as mini solar systems. So they had a disk of sort of dust and gas that eventually fragmented and formed these moons. Their system now is quite evolved. You, know, you don't really have any gas left in the system. You've just got the bodies moving around. So though it does tell us a lot about dynamics, it is quite different from an early forming solar system at this stage. Uh, we can still do quite a lot with observations. I mean, the disks I showed that the ALMA telescope does, if you look at that again in different wavelengths, you pick out different sizes of particles that must be there. So that tells us about how things are colliding and sticking. You can also see structures in the disk, sometimes rings, and there's a big debate of, is that a ring because a planet is carving out a gap? Or is it a ring because of the gas instability? It's a bit like a galaxy spiral. So those sort of observational constraints can really help us tell us more about planet formation. But you're also not wrong that there's a lot of unknowns. I mean, I arm wavingly said, oh, stuff just comes together and sticks. It's straightforward. It is not that straightforward. Uh, getting things to stick can be quite difficult depending on its size. And we haven't fully fathomed out how that all happens yet. OK, thank you very much. Just one quick verification on uh, Concry 55E. Uh, you showed the dry side on the left and the uh, icy side on the right. Uh, but shouldn't the icy side be in R2D2's back? Which side was that? <laughs> <laughs> now you've got me worried. And the planet, the planet is in tidal lock, right? So yes. the, the hot side should always be facing the planet. Is that correct? 
Yes, like that. And so we shouldn't see the IC part on the right of R2D2, but in, in our backs, right? Yes, I may have taken some artistic license there. <laughs> Thank you. Just very. <laughs> so we've got time for maybe one or two other questions. I got one more from online. Can you tell us about the goals of JAXA versus NASA or other space agencies and what makes up these differences? Yeah, absolutely. The first thing I'd like to say is no one goes to space alone anymore. So even NASA, which is huge, um, always has international partners. So for example, the Hayabusa 2 mission, which was the one that recently brought the asteroid sample back, JAXA led, but also carries um, carried a lander made by the German and French space agencies. And the team is very uh, in strong collaboration with the OSIRIS-REx mission by NASA, which will be coming back from asteroid Bennu in 2023. So none of these people are in competition. They work together and they design missions that often in direct collaboration, for example, Bepi Columba mission to Mercury is joint ESA and JAXA. Um, you know, there's no point in being in competition. There just isn't enough money and there's a lot of space to explore. So we, we all work together. JAXA's main focus is small bodies of the solar system, moons, asteroids. This is solar system program is. And the reason for that is these small bodies are evidence of the planet formation process. So they're really leftovers from that collide and stick process. They've ended up in the asteroid belt, they've ended up in the Kuiper belt, really distantly they've ended up in the Oort cloud. So by visiting asteroids, comets and moons, you see relics of what has gone into forming the Earth. And in particular, if that relic hasn't changed too much over the last 4.56 billion years, because they don't have any geological activity, so many of them are what we call pristine, then you get a sample of what might have hit the early Earth. And it's possible our oceans and even our first organics were delivered that way. So they're very important for understanding what might have gone into making a habitable planet. So JAXA has some serious expertise in this area. They did the first sample return mission ever from an asteroid with Hayabusa. And they've just done the second with Hayabusa 2. So landing on small bodies and taking a bite is kind of what we do. So we have um, the Martian Moon Exploration Mission, which is going to go and take a decent chunk out of Phobos and bring it back. We have Destiny Plus, which is going to do a flyby of um, an asteroid that might create the Geminated Meteor Shower every year. And also our links with Bepi Colombo, with Mercury. You know, you're looking at planets that you know, have a magnetic field and that might have been important for the Earth's habitability too. So JAXA is very focused on understanding how habitable planets form through smaller bodies. And we do work very closely with NASA in that regard. NASA can do bigger projects. I mean, things like the James, the James Webb Space Telescope, probably only NASA could have led that. So that's really, really big stuff. But, you know, space agencies join in and we all work together. Hello, um, thank you for coming to speak. Uh, my question is, um, how did we see the space dust and how it formed these bigger planets without actually seeing the planets themselves? Thank you. Yes, good question. So one of the things you really want to do is just have some sort of time dial and you could see how it goes. And of course, we can't do that. So the evidence you've got is that we see all these dusty disks surrounding young stars. They're not there around the older stars, so something happens to them. And planets do, on the whole, orbit in roughly circular orbits in a plane. So that strongly suggests those two things are connected. And then if you look at these disks as they start to develop, you start to see evidence of bigger particles in them, like from very thin dust through to larger objects that suggest there is this sticking process. Then you look at asteroids, such as asteroid Itakawa, visited by the first Hayabusa mission, Ryugu just visited now, and you see they look like rubble piles. Now that's a bit complicated because they probably underwent a giant fragmentation at some point, but it's also evidence that little bits can all stick together to form a larger body. So we know this process works. 
So piecing together all of that evidence is how you come up with the idea that planets formed in this way through this stick and collect system, even though you can't follow the whole process yourself.